and I walked into their bedroom wearing just a pair of black underwear after doing a ritual that night. And I shot them both in the head as they slept. And I remember feeling like someone had just picked this big rock up off my shoulders, like all the burdens of the world had been gone from me, like relief, you know. And I laughed, I giggled hysterically. I had sold my soul to the devil. And so I felt, and I was told, once you do that, that's it. I don't care if you want out or not, you can't get out. For many in the United States and Canada, it's much more convenient. It, it feels better to deny that Satanism is rampant in America and Canada. It feels better to deny that we have young people, by the millions now, captivated in something that can make killers out of them. And yet, my friend, right now, there are over 12 million teenagers and younger children who are now involved in the occult in one way or another. And denying it isn't going to make any difference. See, whether you believe in occultism, whether you believe that Satan has power, whether you believe that Satan can, can give you the things that he's promising these kids, that's immaterial, my friend, because they believe it. How in the world does a young man in the prime of his teen years go from being an A student a football player, holding down a 40-hour-a-week job, plus, I mean, not a, not, a, not a dropout because he only missed a half a day, unexcused absence the whole last year of his high school career. How does that young man become a satanic murderer? To the place where, without any remorse, he walks into a convenience store, and a cold-blooded murder guns down an innocent man. And then, two months later, after doing a satanic ritual, he walks into his own parents' bedroom and kills him and laughs about it afterwards. How does that young man go from that A student football player to a satanic killer? And, more importantly, could it be happening right now to the kid next door, to maybe somebody even in your own family. Let me just say this, Satanism and the occult and what it's doing and will do to our children will not go away. It will not go away. It is not a fad, my friend. And if we continue to deny it, out of sight, out of mind, oh no, no, out of sight, pretend it doesn't exist, next door on your newscasts, in your newspapers, because unless we do something about it, it's not only here to stay, but here to get worse. And the biggest tool that Satan has in his arsenal is the ignorance of people like you and me. So I challenge you to heed what you're going to see and hear in this video. We went to Oklahoma State Prison to interview Sean Sellers, that young man, that Satan turned into a killer. You're going to hear firsthand how it happened. You're going to hear some warnings and see some warnings about some things that you better think about, including music, including movies, including children's cartoons, including games like Dungeons and Dragons. But you're also going to hear, and this is the best part, though Satan said to Sean Sellers, there's no way out. You're going to find out there is. And I'm going to say to every young person that's watching this, every adult that's watching this, there is a way out. And the man, Christ Jesus, who God himself created Satan, is more powerful. Sean Sellers tried on four different occasions to get out of Satanism. The reason he couldn't is that there was no one there to help him. My young friend, my adult friend, we're here to help you. There are others who can help you. Heed what you're going to see. Do not deny it, for that's only going to fan the fire. But together, with the one power that can defeat Satan, we can win this victory for our young people in America. Escaping Satan's web. 
Sean, Satanism is real. You found out the hard way. How widespread of a problem is there really? I mean, we're, we're seeing shows like Araldo and, you know, what have you. How widespread do you feel Satanism is in America? Uh, ten years ago, police and the church pretty much didn't even acknowledge Satanism as being a reality in America. You know, maybe in Africa, maybe, you know, in some other country where there was no civilization or something, but not in grand old America. Over the past five years, the uh, church and the police force have been forced to recognize the existence of Satanism and search out answers for, for dealing with it. Uh, in every school, you've got kids who are interested in the occult. They are uh, either maybe, you know, just dabbling with the music and stuff, heavy, black heavy metal music, speed metal and stuff, or they are into uh, a lot of the movies, you know, Freddy Krueger and Jason and all these other horror movies. And then, uh, then you've got kids who are really interested in the occult, you know, they're really interested in Satanism. And they go out and they get a copy of the Satanic Bible, Satanic Rituals, Necrom Necron, you know, uh, Cavendish's book, Black Book of Arts, and stuff like that. And um, they will begin experimenting with it. But in every school in America, you've got one kid who is at least seriously involved in Satanism or going to be soon. This is real. Uh, you're sitting here now. You have been on death row in Oklahoma prison for three years. You're sitting here with me, you've got the handcuffs, the guards just brought you in here. This is real. And this is where it led you. Uh, there are kids out there right now, the dabblers, uh, you know, the kid that uh, uh, is just fascinated with the occult. Uh, but it's not going to happen to him. What would you say to a kid like that? I was playing with Dungeons and Dragons and I remember on Trinity Broadcasting Network they had a show about it and I sat there for an hour and a half and laughed, laughed, completely laughed at these idiots who were talking about Dungeons and Dragons being the devil's game and how it can lead you into Satanism and how it can lead you down the primrose path and stuff and I was thinking no way look at these fools now this was before right, this, this all happened this is before I even got involved in Satanism okay. and uh, then it happened to me you know, and I realized later on that what an idiot I was for not listening. Kids, for some reason, they don't want to listen to you or to adults or something. But whenever they see the handcuffs, whenever they see that, hey, this kid was just like me, maybe they'll listen to me. And I hope so because it's happening all around you. I guess what I want to try and convey to the kids that are going to watch this program is how does a kid go from A student, football player, what have you, to sitting here facing certain death, save the miracle of God. Let's go back, if we can, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Childhood, birth, your circumstances that got you to where you are. You know, even at eight years old, you, you know, kids are smart enough to question whys and things. And uh, dad, you know, Rick, he had a girlfriend at that time. And uh, his girlfriend came out and told me, I was playing in the yard or something one night, and his girlfriend told me, you know, your daddy loves you. And I was thinking, well, why doesn't he tell me that? Never heard you loved. Uh, no. All the other things that uh, uh, that go through the mind of a young boy as you're growing up were never there as far as dad being there to take you to the Little League games. And... Up until I was about 13, mom and I were pretty close. Mm -hmm. And then I began to, you know, grow up a little bit. First of all, I was always independent. And I pretty much grew up alone like that. You know, for years it was always like that. I always had time to alone whenever I got home from school. And I began to, uh, I think, like that. I still like being alone to this day. What are the signs that your child may be a target of satanic recruitment? According to Satanism in America, they include those that come from middle to upper class homes. They have low self-esteem and a poor self-image. They are highly intelligent. They're loners. They come from broken homes and split families, latchkey kids. They have a deep need for belonging. They're susceptible to peer pressure, impressionable. They may be victims of prior sexual abuse with little parental care or involvement. They are alienated from the church, very creative or curious. They're rebellious and looking for power. They can be over or underachievers. So we've got, a, we, at this point, we've got a boy who did not have a normal upbringing, got started off pretty bad in life, mm -hmm. 
by the time he's 13, things really aren't that much better. Uh, we've got a loner. We've got a kid that now is involved in rock music, playing Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Now, couple that, we'll take all that and uh, apply it with my... You know, that, you know that we're talking to probably millions and millions of kids in America now, and, and parents that are watching this are saying, wait a minute, you know, yeah, my, you know, I've, I've, I've had to rear my children by themselves. Uh, you know, we're talking to the kid who's been the product of a broken home. We're talking to the kid who, you know, up till now, however, there, there's, there's the attitude, well, that, that's sort of normal life. This normal life leads to problems. You know, after, even as I was getting involved in Dungeons and Dragons, I also got involved in a lot of the philosophical aspects of uh, the martial arts. I got involved in Zen. And in Zen, Zen, okay. Zen Buddhism, you know, mm -hmm. and in Zen, you are taught that life is a series of paths. And paths come to a T, and paths come to an X, and Ys, etc. And uh, when, two, when two lives, two roads, two paths come together to form an X, you know, then that is a life, two lives coming together, meeting, and going on. When two lives come together, and one of them stops when they form a T, that is two lives coming together, one of them ending, one of them going on. It doesn't matter how it happened, doesn't matter if it's murder or if it's an accident or sickness or whatever, it's just, it just happens. Karma is karma. And this really began to uh, change my philosophy of life, you know, because up until that point, I had been taught the old Christian values that, you know, that you don't steal, you don't hurt people, you don't kill people, etc. And this new philosophy said that it really doesn't matter because karma is karma. You know, it's going to happen. And uh, so there was no right and wrong there anymore. And the farther I got involved in ninjutsu and stuff and in, in Zen, the more I began to uphold and adhere to these Eastern philosophies. And that, that got me ready for Satanism. That set everything up so that I was completely ready for Satanism. Before somebody can really get into what you got into, there has to be a breaking down somewhere along the line of the values. Some way. It, it either can be emotional, you know, where uh, the kids are going through so many problems or something like that, that they're lashing out in anger, you know, and they don't care anymore about the morals and values because they're so full of anger and hate and they want to get even. It can be through drugs or something where they are forced to, uh, you know, into prostitution or whatever in order to get the drugs, you know, and no right and wrong doesn't matter anymore. They just have to get that. Somewhere along the line, there has to be a breakdown of the traditional values before the Bible, the Bible says that the carnal mind, the mind that is controlled now by drugs, the mind that is now controlled by Dungeons and Dragons, the mind that now becomes controlled by rock music, any time, any place, anywhere <clears throat> that we give our minds over to a different set of values other than God's, it says that the carnal mind is not subject to God, neither can it be. Satan is a master at taking away the value system. As I say to the young people at Freedom Village, if there's one thing the devil's good at, it's destroying dreams. Definitely. Sean Sellers is now 13. He's dabbling with Dungeons and Dragons. He is getting heavier and heavier and heavier into it. Where does the switch now come? You've talked about Zen. Where does the switch now come? to where you're, you're, you're going to actually become involved in Satanism. Okay, first of all, we're gonna go back to whenever I was 10, and I had a babysitter who checked out some satanic books with me at the library. I've always been an avid reader. Whenever I was young, like five or six years old, I taught myself how to read from comic books. You know, I loved comic books, and I wanted to know what the words said, so I taught myself how to read. You know, my parents helped me and stuff. And um, so all my life, I spent a lot of time in libraries, doing a lot of research and reading. And I had a babysitter who we would go to the library one day, check out books, come home, read them, go back the next day and exchange them. And she went up to a place where I wasn't allowed to go and came back down and had some satanic books, like an encyclopedia of witchcraft and something else. Brought them home and we looked at them and did some things with them and stuff. And I thought, yeah, this is neat. And my mom freaked out when she saw them and said, get those out of my house. Don't you ever bring those in my house again. If you ever see those again, you're fired, etc., etc." And, you know, Took, made, them take, made her take them away, but I was interested in it at that time. And then whenever I was 13, actually whenever I turned, just when I turned 14, 
I went from Dungeons and Dragons into trying to find out about witchcraft. I really wasn't interested in Satanism, I just wanted to know about witchcraft. So it started with a uh, trip to the library to uh, teach some people who were involved in Dungeons and Dragons a lesson. I had been involved in Zen, and in Zen you were taught that all battles of the flesh are first fought in the mind. And if you overcome the battle in the mind, then you can overcome the battle in the flesh. So what I was doing is I was researching a dragon. I was going to try to find a mythological dragon from the past, bring it back to life uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, a dragon that could only be destroyed with a riddle, because I knew everyone involved in my group would attack the dragon with swords and everything like that, get killed, and then maybe one of them would finally figure out, let's try something different. I wanted to teach them that mental, you know, aspect. And I found a time, some Time Life books on dragons, and one company, it was called Wizards and Witches. And I was going, hey, yeah. You know, so I got that out, and that old interest in witchcraft was sparked. And you say interest. Is the word curiosity? Definitely. Um, Do all most kids, kids get involved in, in at least fringe occultism through curiosity? The uh, movies that are on, uh, you know, on TV and stuff like that, all these occult movies and stuff, are uh, proof that, 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 it's, that it's the curiosity that it is will bring in kids, you know. All kids seem to be interested in the unknown, the supernatural. The gateway activities to Satanism constitute what is known as the fringe level of involvement. The Ouija board is a seemingly harmless object, yet it can cause big problems. Dungeons and Dragons is a fantasy role-playing game that teaches demonology and other occultic themes. Palmistry and tarot cards as methods of foretelling the future have gotten many involved in the occult. Explicit horror films and heavy or black metal rock music are both popular entrances to Satanism. Occultic books, horoscopes, studying ESP or UFOs have led some to a deeper, more deadly fascination with the power of darkness. Well, at that time, I uh, started playing Dungeons and Dragons. When I was 13, it just, I had never heard of the game before, you know, and I had a cousin who moved in with us, and uh, he played where he used to live, and we went out and got the game and stuff, and I loved it. It was awesome, you know, I mean, it was a game that you played in your mind, you know, anything could be done, and I was a comic book fanatic anyway. I loved comic books, and so my imagination has always been just pretty wild, and, uh, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I had a character that I, uh... Let's pull over and park here for just a minute on Dungeons and Dragons. Is that not one of the most dangerous things that a kid can be playing with today? Okay, people hear the term game, and they get real confused, mm -hmm. especially if they've never seen the game. I mean, the obviously, this is played. sold in... Hobby some stores. Comic stores, it's sold Hobby in bookstores, book uh, reputable bookstores, right. uh, you name them, it's in there. Well, um, Gary Gygax, Brian, Brian Bloom, who created the game, they have grossed, you know, $100 million off the game. I mean, it's big. But uh, you see, it's not a game. It's not a board game, you know. It's a role-playing game. Now, role-playing is so um, psychologically effective that it is used in a, by psychologists. You take on the identity of a character. Right. See, psychologists use role-playing as therapy because it's so powerful. And uh, role-playing is where you have a character, okay? You roll it up on dice and stuff, especially different colored, different sized dice. Now, this character on a piece of paper before you has everything that you have, okay? It is a complete person. You know what color this person's eyes are. You know how much this person weighs. You know what color this person's hair is, how tall he is, how fast he can run with certain weights, you know, how, how long he can run before he gets tired with certain weights. Um, you know... You know, uh, what weapons he's good with. He has a past. You know, what he's afraid of, what he's, uh, what's happened to him in the past. This person is absolute. Now, a teenager who is dealing with reality and not really liking it, who is trying to, uh, you know, get his foot in the door of life and trying to make decisions on what's going to happen to me and realizing that the decision he makes today is going to affect the rest of his life, has a lot of time dealing with that reality. And that character that's in front of them is absolute. It doesn't change. It's a friend to him. And when he becomes that character, 
He knows exactly who he is. He knows exactly what he can do, what he can't do. And the fantasy world that he lives in has no morals, no limits, you know, no values except for his own. And so, so, it's an, so it's an opportunity to escape and really be somebody. Right. He can be. He is a special person with all these absolutes, and he can do whatever he wants to. Okay. And you let a teenager loose in that world, and sometimes they don't want to come back. In Dungeons and Dragons, acting out in the fantasy, uh, people are killed. Mm -hmm. They're raped. Mm -hmm. uh, what else goes on in some of those games? Every character has to have a deity, and God, Yahweh, you know, Yeshua, Jesus is the only God that is not in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so everyone purposely excluded. Probably, mm -hmm. I would have to say so. And uh, well, Jesus is there, but he's this weak, pitiful demigod. No one wants to choose him as their, mm -hmm. you know. And, and you take a vow. You actually take a vow to that deity. Right. See, you. Uh, you have magic spells and stuff that, that you use, you know, if you're a magic user or an elf or a druid or something like that. And uh, you are all, you know, subject to your deity's uh, laws and rules and stuff. And you go on quests for that deity. Also, you, um, you know, the money is, the, the object of the game is to kill monsters and get treasure, okay? And if you've run into some other people, then you kill them and you take their money, you know, they take their treasure. And anything goes in it. Does the average kid... Understand what he's getting involved in. No, no, no way. Um, he's usually invited to come into the game by somebody that's already playing it. Usually, see, whenever and the kids, they're not. The kids playing the game aren't saying, "Okay, let's get someone involved in Satanism. Let's let them get him playing D and mm -hmm. D and D." You know, the kids love the game. It's fun. It really is. And so they say, you know, well, we let's get some more people to play. You know. And the bigger the group is, usually if there's nine people playing, that's a good group for Dungeons and Dragons. And so, you know, the game also, it doesn't have an ending. People don't really understand that. The game can go on for years. Mm -hmm. People can meet every night, you know, for years and play this game continually. The only time the game ends is when the character dies. And if you've been playing a character for, let's say, like I was, I played it for three years and he was 10th level. Now, this character was my friend, this character was me. When that character gets killed... This became like another personality. Yeah. Now, if this character gets killed, that devastates kids. There have been kids who've been involved in Dungeons and Dragons for four or five years. Their character gets killed, they can't handle it, they blow their brains out. Dungeons and Dragons has been called the most effective introduction to the occult in the history of man. It is a fantasy role-playing game that teaches demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex, perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, Satan worship, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination, and many other occultic themes, all in living color. Is this dangerous? You decide. And I uh, discovered rock music for myself. My parents like country music, but I discovered rock music, and so I got into that. Sean Geraldo Rivera, in his first special, and I, I think we all owe him uh, a debt of gratitude. He kind of blew the lid off this thing, or at least was the first secular program willing to, to take this issue head on. He said in that program that not once had they ever interviewed any person involved in Satanism, had never certainly interviewed anyone like yourself who had committed a heinous crime because of Satanism, that rock music was not a part of it, that they were not, not a, a part of that life. Right. I think that has to be definitely taken into account. I don't think that uh, rock music is responsible for all the world's evils, you know, as some pastors I'm sure would maintain, but the rebellious lifestyle that is uh, glorified in rock music does carry over into the kid, you know, into a teenager's mind. And uh, especially with heavy metal music, which is... Uh, always been on the lunatic fringe of, you know, music in general. It uh, deals with things that other music just will not get into. It It deals with uh, Satanism, you know, it deals with uh, a lot of the abuse and stuff that goes on. And there are some really sick songs out there. In your story, 
that I've read, you, you also talked about uh, your fascination with books on the subject of Satanism and, and witchcraft. Whenever you mentioned time life books that you, you went out, we're seeing now, uh, we're seeing the horror movie, the, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street type movie. Uh, we're seeing a, a, a lot of literature that, 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 does that encourage kids to get into this type of activity? Ultimately, I'd have to say yes. You know, I think it's it's really sad when a society's main hero is a psychopathic killer. You know, I mean, the hero of Friday the Thirteenth movies are not the people getting killed. You know, and not the person that kills Jason. It's Jason, and uh, Freddy Krueger is the hero of nightmare stories. You know, My Michael Myers is the hero of uh, Halloween stories. And stuff. Well, you understand, of course. Uh, you know, the movie. Uh, producers and the rock music stars say kids don't pay attention to this stuff. It doesn't affect them. After a con after an ACDC concert, uh, there were some kids that ran out and started beating on the cars and stuff like that. After every heavy metal music uh, concert, you got kids that come out of the concert pumped, usually high, even if they didn't do drugs. They're high from the uh, secondhand dope on the floor and stuff, you know. And they come out with an energy, with a you know, just a, a drive, you know, an anger, and they go out and they're beating each other up and they're fights and all kinds of stuff going on out, right outside the uh, place where the concert was held. So you're, you're, you're not an expert on this subject. You're only on death row because of Satanism. So uh, you would say that, that Satanism, drugs, and rock music go hand in hand? Definitely. I have never encountered anyone who has gotten involved in Satanism that has not been involved in music of, rock music of some kind and drugs. In almost every instance of violence or death as a result of Satanism, heavy metal music has been involved. What does the music really say? Reading the lyrics can help you recognize the evil and potential danger of rock's entanglement with the occult. Heavy metal group Venom offers a blow-by-blow -blow account of an actual human sacrifice. Slayer also speaks of human sacrifice in their song. Serious or not with the occult, a rock band's image has a powerful influence on their fans and parents have a responsibility to know and approve what their children listen to. How do we get into Satanism then? So a senior was 18 years old. This girl gave a speech to the school about being a witch and seeing a human sacrifice. And she had a piece of human skin as proof. A girl gave a speech to her school. Tanya knew that I was interested in Dungeons and Dragons and witchcraft and things like that. Uh, was this sanctioned by the school? Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know, part, I don't know if it's, it was in her speech class or something. I don't know exactly how it, what it was, but she gave a speech and Tanya heard it. And she told me about it and I wanted to get in, talk, in touch with this girl. So... The curiosity level. Right. So uh, Tanya set up a conversation with me, gave her a phone number and stuff. And I called her, and first thing she said to me, I was wanting to get into witchcraft. I really didn't know anything about Satanism. But uh, I asked her, you know, well, you know, what should I do? She says, well, do you want to go white, white magic or black magic? I said, which is better? She says, well, you can go uh, white magic, but it's sort of hypocritical. If you want real power, go black magic. And I said, okay, let's go black magic. And uh, she said the first thing that I had to do was pray to Satan. Okay, now I was pretty mad at God, you know, over a girl and everything. But praying to Satan wasn't really something that I felt like I uh, really wanted to do. So it took me about two or three days to get up the nerve. She told me how to do it. She gave me this magic incantation to use and etc. So when I did it, 
you know, I laid down in my bed and had some candles lit and some incense going and some, laid this, con uh, this incantation and told him that I renounced Christ and that I renounced God and that I would serve only Satan and I wanted Satan to do this and this for me. And I had, it was weird. It's just an experience that uh, got me hooked into it. Um, first of all, I'd done a lot of meditations and stuff because of sin. And so I knew what was happening for part of it. You know, I felt like this lifting sensation. And that's a sign of high alpha, you know, high alpha rate and a sign of you being relaxed. So that was normal. I knew that was, wasn't physical. You know, I wasn't lifting off the bed. It was just something that felt like that. And then the room got cold. And that wasn't natural. That didn't feel right. And then, just as real, if I reached out and touched you, it felt like a hand touched me. You know, like a cold, clawed hand touched me. And I closed my eyes real tight, you know, like, and uh, these hands, they just, they covered my body, I mean, touched me everywhere. And I'd never felt anything like this before. And it was real, it was erotic, it was sensual, and it was completely evil and fear, you know, it was just racing through my hair, was standing up, and my adrenaline was pumping, my heart was beating hard. And then I heard an audible, an audible voice say, I love you. Opened my eyes, knew someone was in the room, someone had caught me. There's no one there. All I saw was spots because I had my eyes closed so tightly and something was still touching me. Closed my eyes again and little by little these hands or whatever they were disappeared and everything returned to normal. I sat up in the bed, my heart was beating, you know, and I was hooked. Satanism was real. You know, I'd never felt anything like that before. And I knew that this was what I wanted to be involved in. I found the supernatural that I'd been look, looking for, and I was hooked into it. Can Satan so possess, so sear a mind that, that uh, in, in your case, you stood there and, and I think you've said you laughed as you looked at the blood pouring out of your mother's head? Satanism takes your, Satanism says motions are no good. If you love, you're weak. If you cry, you're weak, you know? And so the only thing that you have is hatred, anger, you know, that's strength. And Satanism completely warps your emotions. I used to take walks at night. I'd sneak out my window and just walk. And, uh, you know, I love, love nature, love the stars, love the moon. And I would ask myself, God, where is that person that I was at 13, that person that loved animals, that person that, that you know, just, where is he? And... Uh, I couldn't cry anymore. I wondered where my tears had gone. Why had they dried up? I wondered why I couldn't feel anything for the people around me. You know, I didn't like who I was. And it wasn't too much longer after, you know, as I got involved in Satanism, that my family and stuff found out about it. I saw my mother, whom I loved, and I realized that all the stuff that I was doing right now was tearing apart the people that I did care about. And I went to my room. And I had, my mom had already taken away some books and stuff. And I had this notebook that she didn't find. And I was crying. And Dad said that he was no longer proud of me, that I was going to have to earn that back. And I was just devastated. And I picked up that book and I ripped it apart. And I was crying and, and I was just so full of anger. And Mom came in and he also said some things that I'd never known before about whenever I was young and they were driving truck, Mom and Dad, you know, going without a couple of meals so that they could get Christmas or Christmas or birthday presents to me, you know, and things like this. And just all this stuff was coming down on me. And I was ripping apart this notebook and my mom came in and said, I never meant for you to know that. And we hugged and we was crying. And at that moment, I was going to get out of Satanism. I wanted out. With everything that was in within me, I wanted out the occult. I went to a Catholic priest because my dad had been raised Catholic and we'd already tried to talk to a Baptist minister who had baptized me a few years before when I was after this girl and he didn't want to get involved. So I went to the Catholic oh, priest. Time out. You went to a, a preacher seeking some help? Right. And he had a Baptist pastor and he didn't want to help you? Right. I mean, how did he turn you away? What did he say? Well, I don't know. My mother talked to him, and uh, he uh, just said he didn't want to get involved. All right, so there was an attempt to get out of Satanism. Right. I uh, went to the church. I went to 
Baptist, you know, Baptist minister. He didn't want to get involved. I went to a Catholic priest and talked to him for a couple hours, and he basically said, he told me that Adam and Eve weren't real people, that they were just a story of how sin came into the world, and I figured, okay, you don't believe your Bible, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Okay, if you don't believe what you would say you believe in, then you're a hypocrite too, just like all the other Christians out there, and I'm not going to have anything to do with hypocrites. And so he told my mom that she'd taken away all my satanic books. She said, he told her, listen, they're not your books, they're his books. Give them back to him. They don't belong to you. He bought them, you should give them back to him. That didn't work. I went to a uh, Bible study group, some kids that were school, some Christian kids that were school. You know, I talked to them, and I went to a Bible study group, and they quoted a lot of things from the Bible and stuff, but they didn't know how to deal with it, and they didn't know what to do. You know, they told me a lot of things, but they didn't tell me that I didn't have to be a Satanist, and that's what I wanted to hear. And then I uh, called TBN one day, the Trinity Broadcasting Network in Oklahoma City, and I talked to some lady there, and when she found out that I was involved in Satanism, and she found out that I was... And stuff. She said, oh, you've been involved with those witches and stuff then, right? And I went, yeah. And she said, can I pray? And I went, sure. And half an hour later, she's still praying. And uh, mom felt like you shouldn't take family problems to other people, okay? And... Do you wish she had now? I was hoping would she that be, Would she be alive today if she had? I think so. Uh, you, you did go to the, to, the, to the Catholic priest, but... Let me rephrase the question. If mom had kept going until she found somebody who could really help her son, if mom had been willing to take and go outside the family to find that help, if that's what it took, would mom be alive today? Ultimately, yes. The following are 12 steps to assist parents with children involved in the occult. First, don't view their interest as just another phase. Know the danger signs. Determine their intensity of involvement. Look for significant changes in their personality. Become aware of what influences the youth subculture has on your child. You must regain control. Have authority in the home. Don't hesitate to confront the issue. Get help. Seek counseling for the entire family. Remove the negative influences. Detoxify your home from occult influences. Get involved in your child's life. Positive peer groups should be encouraged. You need to become positive parental models. And communicate. If your child is involved in the occult, it's time to build bridges, not walls. Good is evil, evil is good. God was this ruler up on high who didn't care about his children, who just threw lightning bolts at them. Uh, Satan was man's friend and demonstrated that in the Garden of Eden by telling them that evil was better than good and that if you would just look at evil, you would see that it was better and you would rebel against God and you would choose my way. And he, you know, they ate of the apple or whatever it was, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They decided that evil was better and they rebelled against God. God punished them, cast them out of the the uh, garden, therefore he was a very judgmental God. He didn't love his kids. Satan was a friend of mankind. They didn't die, see? They didn't die whenever they said they would. So God was a liar. Where does murder, now not your, not your mother and your father, there was a murder before that. Where does the murder come in? We were doing rituals and stuff. We found this old house. Oh, no, we weren't, didn't find the old house yet. We were doing these rituals and stuff, and we were trying to, to uh, find this old house where we'd heard that half of it had burned down. It would be a great place to hold rituals and things. And my... We had a group called the Elimination, and the Elimination's purpose was to eliminate Christianity. We got to a point where we were doing rituals, and we felt like we weren't getting the power that we needed. We had to invoke demons to get the power that we needed to carry out our purpose, and the demons weren't coming. Your purpose was to destroy Christianity. Right. And we decided that what we needed was a sacrifice. And we did a ritual. And we said, then we said, dedicated our time to Satan, and we went to the store with the only intent of killing this man. Well, we planned on walking in, and one bullet, blam, and that would be the end of it, and it didn't go like that. We talked to him, we bought some Cokes, you know, we were going through a change, we bought this and that, you know, candy, stuff like that. Um, then we took him outside, they were talking about their clutches or something, 
And uh, Richard wanted to show him how we put it. We just put a new clutch plate in Richard's car and wanted to show him the pressure and stuff on it because he had to do the same thing to his. And then when he went back inside, I was sitting on the gun. It was a 357 revolver. And uh, I was sitting on the gun, and Richard said, all right, let's do it. I picked up the gun, and I went to walk in. Richard walked in before me. The guy went behind the counter. Richard went back over here and picked up something and said, how much is this? Distracted the man so he wouldn't be looking at me when I came in. I walked into the store, and the man took a drink from his coffee cup and said something to Richard and set it down. And just as he looked up at me, I pulled the gun up and fired. And I missed. It, I wasn't used to this revolver, and it had more kick to it than I was used to. And I found out at the trial that it grazed his ear. Okay, And he jumped, and he looked at me. And he picked his hands up, and he started going, OK, man, OK, OK. And he started moving towards the cash register. Richard came up from the back of the store. I thought you wanted to rob him? I guess. Went to the back of the store. But and there was no intent to rob it at, at all, was there? No. Strictly to kill. Right. To satisfy Satan. Right. We, mm -hmm. We'd broken all the Ten Commandments, except thou shalt not murder. And that's what we were going to do to prove our allegiance to Satan. So. He, uh, as a replay, I've seen it over and over again. I used to have nightmares over and over again seeing this. But as he looked into my eyes, I know that he saw what was fixing to happen. And he realized that, hey, I know these kids. They can identify me. I, I can identify them. They're not here to rob me, you know? And he took off running that way. Richard came up from the back and got in front of the counter. He slipped and fell just as I fired again and it grazed his shoulder. I heard him scream, so I thought I got him. Richard and I traded places. He was running back and forth behind the counter. Richard and I traded places, and he must have gotten confused. He, so he must have saw Richard and thought it was me, and he ran this way, and I was already coming this way, and he almost ran into me. And it, I was only a couple feet away from him, and I fired, and blood splattered the wall, and he fell. And, I, and Richard was leaning over the cash register, I don't know why. And uh, I turned around and said, let's go. Go. And he walked out the door. I walked out the door, we got in the car, and we left. On the way out, you know, on the way out, it was strange. We had walked in the store. We'd taken no money, no merchandise. We had talked to the man for two hours, come, you know, laughed with him, goofed with him. And when we left the store, all we took was the life of an innocent man for Satan. And in the car on the way home, we giggled and we laughed about it because this man had been so stupid, so foolish that he had actually trusted us and didn't suspect a thing, that he had been laughing with us one minute and running from us the second. We went home, and the next morning we got up and was, uh, we were going back to my house, and right beside a road that we had been on hundreds of times, we saw this house that we'd been looking for for months. You know, and there, was, there it was, just wham. We both the one you were looking at to do your rituals in, right the half-burned house. Right, and we saw it, we both knew that was the house, you know, and we both saw it at the same moment. And we pulled in, we went, you know, drove back, pulled in, and uh, we took that as a sign that Satan had received our sacrifice. We did rituals and stuff there, you know, we fixed it up, we put, nailed some panels up over windows so at night you couldn't see any candle lights and stuff coming out. There was a, an old cellar down in there that we were cleaning out and everything, you know, and. And we began to talk about doing stuff. There was an old bathtub. Was there anybody else involved besides you and Richard? Yeah, there were other people, but uh, we were the ones who were setting it all up. We were the ones that were doing okay. it. Richard and I began to talk about doing things to people. Uh, there was an old girlfriend of his that he didn't like, and we were talking about raping her and cutting her up into little pieces and things like that and making jokes about it and laughing about it always. We were talking about uh, there was this old stop sign where uh, no one had ever stopped on this road. and. Uh, we were talking about taking a 30-30 and sitting beside the road and, and picking cars off as they went by if they didn't stop at the stop sign. You know, things like this. This is what our mentality was. This is what Satan had given us. This is what we thought was cool. Too much.
I was doing rituals all night long. I believed that Satan was my friend and the demons were my brothers. I didn't want to uh, insult demons, you know, I didn't want to be afraid of them. I asked them to enter my body in rituals. I told them, this is your sanctuary, come into me, I will protect you, I will be your friend. You know, if you will serve me, then I will serve you. I uh, started doing a lot of drugs and stuff. I was high all, all, every day, I was taking speed every day. I was working, I was going to school and doing rituals all night long. And it finally just came to a head. And as I was doing the rituals all night long, as I was taking speed during the day, smoking joints, you know, and stuff during lunch, I was, you know, uh, working, doing rituals all night long, all this stuff was happening. I just finally started losing control. Um, at parties and stuff, I would start doing weird things. And people if you didn't have that. control, who did? I was invoking a lot of demons, asking them to enter my body. And there was a, I believe, a demon entity that was named Ezra. And this was my satanic name. It was given to me in a ritual while I was alone. And Do you feel those demons first entered you because of uh, Dungeons and Dragons? I don't know. I think more, maybe, but uh, these I knew the demons were in my body when I was in Satanism because I was asking them to. That was my purpose in Satanism. And I believe that uh, the entity, you know, the demons got together and basically made one entity, you know. Every demon that I called in my body increased the power of this one entity named Ezra. And whenever I got so tired on speed that I just went to sleep, you know, and my body kept going. Ezra was the one that was that was driving. I woke up driving my pickup, not knowing where I'd been or where I was going. I woke up in third hour of school one time, not remember getting up in the morning, going to school, first and second hour. You know, people were telling me that I was doing things that I didn't know I was doing, that I had no recollection. I was swore they were lying to me, trying to confuse me. You know, and it finally came to a point to where I had no. It seemed like I had no choice. I was mad at my parents. I came home from work one night. They went to sleep, and. I had my father's gun, 44 revolver, and I walked into their bedroom wearing just a pair of black underwear after doing a ritual that night. And I shot them both in the head as they slept. What went through your mind, Sean, as you stood there? Nothing. I remember it now, sort of. Everything's still real foggy, but there was nothing that what was going through first? my mind, my father. Any reason for the order? Any thoughts going through your mind? Uh... He was an ex-Green Beret. And he was a problem. You know, he was dangerous. Because he was crowding you? I don't know what it was. I can't find a reason. I've really searched for a reason. All I can know is that, you know, when you're a kid and your parent whips you or something like that, you say, well, don't they get hit by a truck or something? You wish bad things upon your parents because you're angry. And I think that escalated into this with my, me and my satanic mentality and the demons that were going on and my subconscious going, you know, just caught up in all this stuff. I think that's all I could find to do. That's the only choice I could make was to get them out of my life. And uh, So you aim the gun. You're in, you're in your black underwear because of your ritual. You've just gotten through with your ritual. You walk into the bedroom. I mean, do you do you walk from one side of the bed to the other, or do you stand at the end of the bed, or how do you how do you? I've been this? involved in ninjutsu for a few years then, and uh, I was very quiet. I knew how to walk quietly. I knew how to breathe properly, and I was very silent. I walked up to this bed, and I pointed the gun, my father's head, and I squeezed the trigger, and I immediately lifted the gun to where I knew my mother's head was. I couldn't see it anymore because the flash had blinded me, but I knew where it was and I squeezed the trigger again. And then, as the flash wore off, I saw her head come up, and I fired again. So you shot your mother twice. Right. And then I walked out of the room, took a shower. The shower I remember well, as because it worked out. As you looked at him, though, I've heard you describe, your, as you looked at the, the hole in your mother's head. I took a shower, and I got woke up real good because of the cold water. I walked back into the room and I turned on the light. And the blood was pouring out of a hole in my mother's face. And it was pooling with the water in the water bed that had been pierced by the bullet. And I remember feeling like someone had just picked this big rock above my shoulders, like all the burdens of the world had been gone from me, like relief, you know. And I laughed, I giggled hysterically, just like we at Richard and I had done at the Circle K. You know, just like you'd see some Freddy Krueger doing the movies or something, I laughed. And there was nothing in that room, no compassion, 
no tears, no, no love. There was nothing but evil and hatred and anger. Satan had taken everything. Yes. Sean, you wake up in, in jail. Uh, what's your first thoughts? I mean, how do, you, how do you begin to pull? I mean, wait a minute, Satan, this is not what you promised me. Uh, wait a minute, when, when does it start dawning on you that you may just have been deceived? I woke up in the jail cell and I didn't really know where I was, what was going on. And a guy came by and says, hey, heard they got you for uh, killing your parents. And I went, what? No, no way. You know, that's a lie. And then they came by the next day and said, hey, got, heard they got you for another one, some convenience store operator. I was going, no, all this isn't happening. This is not true. This is not real. But I'd already made an unconscious decision that I didn't have anything to do with Satan. In fact, I decided I was going to take the manly way out and kill myself, you know, just end it all. And uh, I decided I was going to hang myself because that was all I had to do, and there wasn't anything in the cell to cut myself with or anything. And decided the only thing I had to hang myself with was with my pants. So I tried to take my pants off and looking for a place to hang from. And I thought about Angel, and I thought, no, I will not do that to her. And we were both two confused kids getting involved in a bunch of stuff that we didn't need to. I had knelt at an altar of Satan covered in blood. You know, I had hated God. I had cursed God and cussed God. I'd said some creative things against God. I had done everything I could to hurt God's people. I had knocked Christians down. I had, you know, said bad things, but I'd done everything I could. And I realized at that moment, man, that after all I had done, that God still loved me, that Jesus still loved me. And something hit me. The words of Mike Warnke on his tapes, the tapes that I'd listened to over and over again as, as entertainment, I heard what he was saying now. I heard the message. You know, the, uh, the stuff that I'd heard in, in, in church when I was a kid, going to church every once in a while, you know, Easter or stuff like that, I understood. And I, I'd been baptized, you know, a couple years before, and so I thought I'd been a Christian, even though I hadn't been. And so I prayed the only prayer I knew how. I said, Lord, on my knees, I said, Lord, here I am again. Now, if you'll take me back, I'll serve you in a minute. I began to cry. Now, up until that time, like I said before, my tears were dried up. They were gone. I couldn't cry. I wondered where my tears were, and I began to cry. And I cried, and I prayed for two hours. And something within me was happening, and I didn't understand it. But I knew it was something real. It was more real it was more supernatural than that time on my bed when i felt the hands touch me what would you say to the kids who are watching now be they at whatever level they're in in satanism mm -hmm. hey letters and stuff from i don't know how many kids you know some of them involved in the occult some of them wanting out some of them who don't want out some of them want information from me to get deeper you know they don't believe that i'm really a christian I've been working with other ministries and stuff for about two years um, and been able to counsel with kids involved in the occult. And, you know, every time I find someone who gets involved in Satanism and stuff, I find that there are reasons below that, you know. They didn't get involved in Satanism because they wanted to be a Satanist. They got involved in Satanism because maybe their father abused them, you know. Maybe they were, uh, had incest or something going on in the homes. Uh, something was going on whenever they were children. And if you are involved in Satanism, you know, be honest with yourself. Look at your life. Look at what's going on around you and ask yourself, why are you doing this? I asked myself that question and I realized that I didn't want to be a Satanist anymore. I tried to get out. And for me, there was no one there. There was no one who knew how. But you've got, a, you've got that choice to make right now. And if you will just say to yourself, why am I involved in Satanism? I think you'll find some answers that you've been looking for for a long time. And you know, God doesn't want to make you into the person that you don't want to be. God doesn't want to make you into me or to Pastor Brothers or to someone you see on TV or some minister or something like that. God wants to make you into the best you that you can be. You know, we are all created with an empty spot within themselves. And for our entire lives, 
we look to things to try to fill that empty spot. God created that within us, and he gave us an insatiable desire to fill it so that we would seek and search him out. Because you see, God's the only thing that can fill that. Think about what's going on in your life. Think about what you're doing. You know, are you happy right now? I was not happy as a Satanist. I've never met anyone who's a Satanist who will be honest with himself who like, likes what's happened in their life. You've got a chance to have all your dreams fulfilled. You've got a chance to be the best you you can be. And that is only going to happen through Jesus Christ. It's not a difficult thing to do. You can call Fletcher Brothers. You can call me or Ministry of Radical Teens for Christ. You can write us. Get in touch with somebody who cares. I care. Pastor Brothers cares. We care about you. It's not a difficult decision to make. If you want help, there's help to be found. But you're the only one that can make that decision. I can't make it for you. You know, your friends can't make it for you. You're the only one. Satanism promises that it's going to give you all your dreams. It's going to make you feel great. It's going to give you power. You're going to have control of your life. I've never seen that come true. Satanism is the ultimate force of self-destruction. You've seen me. You see these handcuffs. You see where I'm at. This is where Satanism put me. You've heard the stories of other kids where Satanism put them. Man, that's not the way. Wise up. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not some preacher on some pedestal. I'm talking from experience. I've been there. I've walked where you are. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus Christ is the only way. And he's waiting for you with open arms if you would just let him into your life and give him a fair chance. That's all we're asking. Give Jesus a fair chance in your life. God bless you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. One of these days we won't shake any outside of this place without these. Thank you. Okay. okay. Satanism in America, what they don't want you to know. This new publication will give you the facts on occult and satanic activities that threaten you and your family. The purpose of this magazine is to teach you safety through awareness. 42 pages full of facts, interviews, data, and interesting articles, all designed to give you the knowledge to protect your loved ones from those that would harm them. You'll learn what's wrong with games like Dungeons and Dragons. Ouija boards and much more. Know the different levels of Satanism and how and where Satanists operate in your community. Ignoring or pretending that Satanism doesn't exist could be the worst mistake you ever make. So get your copy today of Satanism in America, what they don't want you to know. <laughs>